studying fungi. Um, and initially, so he started studying fungi as a means to like uh, investigate ways we could repair the environment um, using a biological approach. So bioremediation is that method of using the natural metabolic function of fungi or back or fungi or bacteria, algae or plants to break down or sequester or stabilize environmental contaminants. Uh, fungi kind of led me into soil, so it kind of led me into larger ecologies and plants. Um, so it kind of definitely has got an interesting intersection, all that. So that's my introduction. Morrison, um, I got into aquaponics as a kid. Um, I used to sell um, fish. I'd breed them and sell them at the pet store. And I always had living plants in my aquariums. And I just noticed that there was this... Um, unite our union between plants and fish and after the fish were done breeding they would have beaten up the tank so i'd put the plants in the hospital tank where i'd put sick fish if i had any and then there was this one bad actor who's a great breeder but he ended up beating on the females too much and i got mad at him and threw him in the hospital tank and never took care of it and all of a sudden i noticed his fins got huge uh the plants started doing really well so there was this connection that i found and Later on in life, um, I went through a divorce, which drove me to start looking at a new path in life that was more soulful. Um, and I went back to my love of fish. And so I started playing around with fish waste streams, which are basically fish manure or fish frass, um, at which point I noticed an incredible uh, ability for this material once it was stabilized to really help plants grow and, and thrive. And after a number of years, uh, a friend of mine just kept bugging me to go see this, this person named Elaine, who I had no idea who she was. And so eventually I, I caved and went down and met her. I brought a, a vial of my fish manure and I showed her, I gave it to her. She put it under the microscope and was just blown away. She was like, what is this? How did you get it? And that was down at the Rodale Institute back about 10 years ago, I guess now. Um, and that started me down this path of, of a better understanding of soil and soil biology. Um, I spent about 18 months, three to four days a week down there. I uh, got one hell of an education and have been on the, um, you know, soil healing uh, trajectory since then. And then I got into soil engineering because a lot of soils are not suitable for biological life. Either they're too compacted, too much to one part or another. The way I like to look at soil is that it's... Um, three things it's the physical soil it's the biological and it's also the chemistry and if you take all three of those into effect you can do amazing things um, if one of them are out of balance then it can be problematic so i've got a quite a diverse history behind that which i won't go into tonight um, but you can always look me up on kingdom aquaponics llc.com and hear my whole backstory but i'm excited to chop it up craig and Leaf, uh, a couple friends of mine uh, that we've been doing a Friday night study group and talking about all kinds of things, biological, uh, from viruses right on up to, uh, you know, plants that are perhaps single celled. And so I figured we could kind of do this on a, on a more public platform and, and, you know, answer some questions. Awesome. Thank you, Leighton. And uh, Leaf will be joining us as well. He's currently uh, driving back. So some spotty reception. Uh, Leaf, uh, are you able, are you? Are you here? Are you able to introduce yourself momentarily? If not, we'll kind of just keep the room going. Yes, yes, I I am here. Now, now they figure out how to use the unmute button on this app. Um, I I just popped in for the end of uh, what Leighton was saying. So I, are we doing like kind of like introductory context stuff right now? You got it. That's correct. Oh, yeah. All right. Well, um, I guess... <laughs> Give, give, give some perspective on what, what, what I might be trying to provide for the conversation. I think this is about soil. We're talking about soil and living soil. And uh, well, I, guess, I guess to go back to like, um, I, you know, I, I was probably a, a, a person without a lot of aim or direction in my life for a long time. But I was like, biology is cool. The natural world's cool. I want to learn about how it works. I learn about, uh, you know, how, what the environment's up to. I studied ecology as an undergraduate, ecology and evolutionary biology, learned a lot about different types of animals and plants and what they did and did some research on, on like frog vocalization patterns and then did a little, got a little research gig after school studying like declining 
plant populations that were leading to declining lizard populations in the central and southern California area. Uh, it was basically a study of arboreal lizards, lizards that rely on trees to uh, to uh, breed, more or less. And then after doing that research for a while, I, it, you know, it was cool work. I got to travel. I got to see cool air. You know, any, of, any of you ever been to the Mojave Desert or the mountains of central California, really awesome area. But it also felt a little bit uh, a little bit passive, you know, doing that kind of conservation ecology because it's like observing that, yes, the plants are dying. And as a result, the animals are dying and things are getting hotter and, you know, and the weather's getting more extreme. But it's kind of like, where are these observations going? You can give these observations to people, but they may or may not take that information and do something useful with it. They might, you know, make other interpretations than what someone who is the person really interpreting that information would think. So eventually that got me more interested in the whole concept of like habitat restoration. There's obviously a lot of degraded land, a lot of degraded spaces on our planet and what could be done to make them of a higher quality than they are. And then, you know, I had years in between going to school of doing various types of work, but then, you know, I decided to get back into it. I went to get a master's and kind of focusing on environmental toxicology, environmental chemistry, because the topic of bioremediation had really become, uh, you know, an interesting one to myself, uh, you know, because, you know, so I learned about you know, fungi, plants, bacteria, they can actually like do things to break down these pollutants, break down these contaminants and potentially even like build new ecosystems. So I, yeah, I did that for a while. Or, no, I did it for two years because that's how long a master's degree is. I did some, did some research, but then, at that point, that was when I really kind of got hooked on the like the, the the fungi. Fungi are an important thing because they seem to be so important to our ecosystems. They're doing so much, and most not. And when I say most people, I don't just mean like lay people. I mean like even even expert scientists who are like you know world leading experts in environmental sciences don't really know shit about fungi and what they're doing. So I was like, this there, there's you know this might be a good thing to explore. And through exploring fungi, I worked in commercial mushroom farming, got into environmental consulting, but then from looking at fungi and then thinking about soil and restoring soil, then you start to see that it's not just fungi. Fungi work in concert with all these other organisms. So it was kind of like, you know, zooming into the fungi and then zooming back out to the ecosystem where I kind of started. And uh, so I'm, I'm glad to have met, you know, people like Craig and Leighton I mean, to have, you know, these conversations to try to go deep into like, what, what does this mean? What, what is nature? How does, what is nature and what is nature made of? And like stuff we see and we know is important, like how soil is created, how a plant grows, like what's really going on there. And uh, yeah, that's a question I'm still trying to figure out. Definitely. Awesome, Lee. Thanks for the uh, reintroduction. And kind of refresh for anyone who just joined us, um, a lot of this conversation can be talking about the notion of a, a living soil, definitely the sexy soil kind of, kind of catches the eye, but the idea is we're ultimately trying to replicate an ecosystem. We understand that through the process of evolution over several billion years, organisms co-evolved together to fill different niches. Uh, from the whole aspect of scale from micro to macro, from different kingdoms, from from the bacteria to archaea to plant to animal to fungi and all of the viruses in between which which fall their in each individual roles and interconnections and niches as well so definitely some interesting perspectives we'll hope to bring to everyone tonight we want definitely want to have some people up um also want to introduce edward who helped kind of organize the group tonight edward do you want to share a little bit about yourself and maybe how you how you met layton and other details and we'll kind of after that we'll kind of get rolling sounds great thanks for having me and uh uh, thanks for being here, everybody. Uh, I met Leighton on the beach in Southern California. Um, we ran into each other right around the time COVID exploded. So we had the beach to uh, to enjoy. And uh, we just got to know each other. And by chance, we started chatting one day because I knew he was a talker. And uh, I got on Clubhouse and he told me about what he did. And I thought, oh, man, that's fascinating stuff. I've done a few podcasts uh, related to cannabis and growing. And I've also been fascinated with the biology of the purity because I know that some of the plants um, in the cannabis kingdom are not as good as they should be. So that's my fascination. Um, I love a great story. I do podcasts for people and companies, and I just enjoy it. And so I'm very happy to be here today, and I'm just going to help along. And Craig's going to kind of run it, and I'm going to moderate and do what I can. So thanks for having me. 
Awesome. Excellent. Thanks, Edward. Really appreciate the insight. So yeah, I guess maybe we'll feel free to come up. Uh, we'll try to have people come up uh, one at a time, kind of keep the stage um, small to kind of keep track of certain things. We'll see how it kind of goes from there. Uh, and so far, the first one to raise their hand is Sebastian. So I'm going to bring up Sebastian and maybe we can uh, get some questions from the audience and we can kind of roll on the perspective into a group guided discussion. How's it going, Sebastian? It's going great. Thank you very much for pulling me up on stage, Craig. I appreciate it. How are you guys today? Doing great. Doing good. Week's wrapping up. Um, finally, I'm in I'm in New York State, so we've had a fair bit of snow here. We didn't have any last winter, so things are starting to thaw. Uh, getting ready to focus on some gardening and composting projects uh, starting up in March, so stoked for that. Very nice. It's a great time of year to be doing that. It's pretty warm out here in California today. It's in the seven, low 70s. Uh, very dry. I'm in Sonoma and I have a little garden. It's producing a huge amount of leaf vegetables right now. And we've had very little rain. So it's kind of scary for what it's going to be like in summer, but definitely good gardening right now. Excellent. Yeah. Um, did you want to have any questions about living soil or kind of the themes you talk about emulating ecosystems you mentioned, or even just some insights or questions of experience you wanted to share? Um, well, I work for a company that manufactures living soil at scale, and I wanted to just throw out some questions maybe about biochar and how you guys see biochar being involved in any of the cultivation you do or any of the relationships between, say, biology and fungi. I know a bunch about it already, but I think it's a really interesting topic of conversation. I just want to see if you guys have got anything you want to talk about there. That's an excellent starting point. Leighton, would you want to take it away? I'm going to ship my gob and let other people talk. <laughs> well, welcome, Sebastian. Yes, uh, you know, biochar has always been an, an, an interesting concept. Um, I know that there's Indians uh, down in South America that had used it to uh, really regenerate some beat up soils. Um, and I've also been, you know, an advocate of being careful with biochar. Uh, concerns me that um, you know people are using uh, wood to to burn and make energy uh, or waste energy, uh, create CO2 for a product that can be naturally harvested. Out out here in California, we have tons of wildfires where we could have access to uh, unlimited amounts of that material. Um, also, in my studies, um, I have found that there is a level of biochar that gets to be a really problematic. If you get over about 20%. Uh, by volume in your soil profile, the biology will set up shop on the biochar um, and not really um, cohabitat with the plants. They they just would rather you know do their thing and not not bother being a, a <laughs> servant to the master, so to say. But so they've uh, got too comfortable then, is what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. And so you know, I, I just have my fears about humanity and the concept that if a little is good more is better and i you know call them morons and so you know i have to really you know make sure that i beat that home with people and this goes back to an experiment i did with pit moss uh, at the phipps conservatory in um in pennsylvania pittsburgh pennsylvania and we were they were trying to become more sustainable and get away from using peat moss and synthetic fertilizers for their display plants um, and so we did an experiment with pit moss uh, biology. I, I was the supplier of all of the um, biological products. <clears throat> and what we found is that the biology just set up shop on the paper and did not, you know, did not work with the plant at all. So the experiment was a lesson, a lesson in understanding that, you know, there is a certain balance that is required. Um, I like biochar as a filtration but it's not feasible because you can use it to filter once or twice. And then now you've got to dump the material because it's no longer um, acting as a filter, but now it's biologically charged. So as far as, as, as biochar as a vehicle to deliver biology into a soil system, I love it. I think it's a fantastic um, way to start regenerating some of these soils that have been so badly depleted, uh, commercial farming, ag, big ag, and so forth. So that's my two cents on biochar. Leif, uh, you want to share some of your insights on biochar? Yeah, I don't, I don't have a whole lot um, except for, I mean, you know, the basic fundamentals that, the, you know, the the biochar material has a lot of small pore space and it can potentially become more or less like a hotel for various soil microorganisms. And 
I know there's there's a guy around here where I live in Asheville, North Carolina. There's a guy who's an old soil scientist, has a biochar company here, and he's got like three different uh, grades of biochar. Like one is just the biochar that they make, but then they have like one biochar that's mixed with a little bit of worm castings or something. And they have another one that they've mixed with like, you know, high grade compost tea and worm castings. And they have some fancy name for it, but it's like that one is like a supercharged biological inoculum, whereas the other, you know, their cheaper biochar is just empty biochar. And they say like the, just the straight up biochar that hasn't been inoculated, it's not something you'd want to put in your garden because it's actually going to extract nutrients from it. Because like the, the physical chemistry of the biochar surface is that, you know, it's, it's there's always pores that microorganisms can uh, inhabit. But at the same time, there's a lot of charged binding sites all over the material, which is kind of, you know, a physical property of it, which can suck nutrients out of the soil if it hasn't been saturated ahead of time. But um, the, I don't know, the, the more like kind of like a novel, interesting thing I wanted to bring up is um, because me and Craig have been, <laughs> we've been trying to design this uh, redox potential lecture recently that we're going to be given on Sunday. And uh and one of the people we've been learning about this from mentioned uh, mentioned biochar in the context of like how do you manage oxidation reduction potential pH and things like that in your soil and is like how does biochar affect redox potential and and his answer and this guy's probably the world leading authority on this was basically like you have no idea how biochar is going to affect the pH and redox potential of your soil if you don't if you don't know what it was made out of in the first place because it's really the the parent materials of it what type of tree what type of wood you know like is it a bunch of acorns and pine needles or what type of wood is in it and so it's it's hard to just say like biochar is going to do this or that it's like what was the biochar made out of and that's going to be really important too and uh, yeah that's that's all I'll say for now yeah, definitely. Um, and so the the notion kind of to go back what Layden mentioned, um, the 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 terra petra, which was what uh, which was what the, uh, the 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 Portuguese used to describe the land in uh, in Central and Mesoamerica that was utilized by the in indigenous populations there. Basically, it was Amazonian dark earth or Indian black earth, but terra petra. But talks about that. This has been an application that's been utilized with humans for for quite a while, particularly indigenous populations. Uh, on another two is that composition is really important. Uh, the materials that you're using, the the plant-based materials, are going to have a significant, uh, you know, effect upon the structure uh, based upon the fact that different plants uh, have evolved different strategies based upon the selective pressure in their environment. Uh, environment, the kind of the combination of their of their matrix of wood, you know, or their or their plant tissue, the matrix of uh, of cellulose, uh, lignin. Uh, and hemicellulose links them in these different proportions. So think about how there's different wood types, oak versus uh, versus a pine or a teak or an impe, these different structures. And based how you're going to be, uh, you're going to be calcin you're, you're going to be uh, driving that to super high temperature to calcination and forming the structure that's going to be basically affect um, some of the qualities of the actual material. There's an actual paper from 2017 um, that I'll try to drop now, and I'm sure I can find some way to do the show notes. Uh, it was biological technologies for remediation of uh, co-contaminated soil. So this is basically soil that uh, has a combination of both uh, organic contaminants, so petroleum hydrocarbons, um, pesticides, along with inorganic contaminants, so heavy metals and other sources that are uh, a bit, you can't really degrade per se, but you have to immobilize. So they did a study on a couple different types of uh, starting material for calcination, orchard prune, wheat straw, sugar cane straw, bamboo and rice straw, broadleaf hardwood, and they noticed there were different effects upon uh, the consequences of the applications for heavy metals in the soil based upon the type. So I think definitely biochar is really exciting. There are definitely use applications for it. Uh, like Leighton mentioned, um, when you're overpassing a certain percentage, uh, the microbes, even if you do charge it, they would prefer to stay in there because there's all this high surface area in general uh, to that degree. So I think biochar is really exciting. There needs to be some good science driven towards it, and especially with a lot of regenerative techniques. Uh, and living soil or, or ecosystem simulation techniques, this biointensive form of growing plants. Uh, there's a lot of good, um, there's a lot of good things to be investigated, right? This is something too, where when we do science of these processes, science isn't about proving, it's about reducing uncertainty. Uh, only mathematicians and logicians actually prove 
things. So the big thing is too, there's all this amazing anecdote people are doing and seeing, but we got to write what's, you know, the difference between science and screwing around is writing your data down and the reproducibility. So hopefully that's a nice little oversight to the notions of what biochar is, some implications and kind of going on another note as well. When people produce biochar, you can also charge it. So this is the notion you can produce it, but then also inoculate it with a a uh, form of uh, a microbial inoculum. Some people that are into Bokashi will inoculate it with affected microorganisms. Uh, you can potentially inoculate with different compost teas. Uh, and even too, I, I'm sure as well, there's some approaches where you can even inoculate with, uh, with uh, a liquid form of indigenous microorganisms from a natural farming technique. So that was a little overview. Sebastian, uh, what do you, you think of that little kind of overview? Oh, that was great. I mean, so much stuff there, so many different things. And I, I would um, just love to add in that the temperature that biochar is made at when it's baked in a pyrolytic oven is really key. Yes. Um, that's super important, you know, between 700 and 900 Fahrenheit and, and definitely what its source material is, is also important, particularly if that's a manure or some other kind of nutrient uh, based material, it'll have a nutrient um, signature once it's made into biochar. Um, there's a lot of bio biochar being produced as uh, byproducts from say forestry gasification and that's what our company uses in our soil mixes um, and you know really more than about 10 percent in soil is pretty much unnecessary and somewhere between two and ten percent is ideal um, it's a it's a fascinating thing the one thing i wanted to add was there's a great paper by a scientist called kelpie wilson called how biochar works in soil which you can find online through the biochar journal, it's free, you can download it. It's fascinating, it kind of summarizes a lot of the science around biochar. And one thing she points out there that's really interesting, which speaks to what you were saying about microbial activity on biochar, is that biochar is like a semiconductor in the soil and biology will actually swap electrons with biochar to increase its metabolism. So that's something that I think is incredibly fascinating when you think about what it means for a living organism to swap an electrical charge with a you know, basically a, an inert piece of carbon, even if it's a, a lattice and charge, it's it's similar in some ways to what happens between synapses in our, it's electricity or energy going between two things. So that's something I've always been fascinated with, but thanks very much. I appreciate your info. Definitely, yeah, the electrodynamics are pretty fascinating. So Leaf and I are actually gonna be giving a talk uh, on this. I believe it is Sunday at 9 a.m. Pacific, uh, noon Eastern time. Uh, it's part of the brief, uh, part of the Everflux Academy, so the, uh, the SCCA, uh, Learn Living Soil. Uh, and so what's really amazing that Sebastian just mentioned is that oftentimes in agronomy or growing plants, we talk about pH, 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 pH. And so pH in general is looking at the concentration of available protons. However, uh, which is something that is just as important but not talked about is EH or ox or redox potential. So basically the, the, the potential for things to be reduced. Um, so Sebastian talked about how biochar can accept electrons uh, and this is the uh, the reduction. So if you ever have a flashback to your uh, high school chemistry class and redox, you know, it's a little terrifying and it's a complex thing to think about electrons and protons and kind of the, the base underlying principles of how reality works on that level. Um, reduction is the uh, gain of electrons or accepting of electrons and oxidation is the loss of electrons. So donator versus acceptor. And a little analogy is um, photosynthesis is a reducing reaction. So the plant, what it's doing is taking a, it's taking a, uh, and it's, it's taking an electron uh, donor, the CO2, which has uh, CO2, which has extra electrons attached to it, combining it with uh, H2O, which is electron acceptor, and then using energy from, from the sunlight to basically make sugar. So it's a reducing reaction. So a lot of plants internally are a reduced state, but uh, we'll get into that uh, definitely for sure. Sebastian, I'm going to move you back to the audience. Uh, and we're going to move on to Ethan, and then we're going to try to just keep the stage kind of small. Thank you, Sebastian. Great to have you. What's up, Ethan? How's it going? Thanks so much. Um, hello. Uh, thanks so much for uh, this room. Um, I feel like I have a lot of questions for you guys. Uh, I'm based here in Boston and uh, very interested, have been doing some no-till community gardening, but very interested in how uh, living soil and, and cannabis and hemp, uh, sun-grown, that whole movement can establish itself on the East Coast. But um, uh, but the, my immediate question um, is if you if you refresh the um, if you pull down to refresh, I have a picture of a of a park uh, where I live in East Boston. Um, and it's about it, it's a former fountain and it's about I would say it's about 25 feet in diameter. 
Um, and I'm proposing a public art project, which is about regenerating this soil. Um, and uh, I know some basics around living soil, but for no, I have never kind of regenerated a piece of land. Um, and I was excited by the idea of using biochar uh, as a structure and whether there'd be a way to have uh, use fires on the, on the land uh, as a sort of dramatic public event in addition to, to serving the soil. Um, but I, I would think that bi producing biochar is more complicated and maybe requires higher temperatures. But I guess my general question is, um, from your points of view, what, what is the process of regenerating a, a piece of land um, or, or what are the questions I should be asking myself? I'm going to pass it off to Mr. Leighton Morris. <laughs> all right, Ethan. Um, you know, it all starts with the understanding that soil is three components. Um, I started out with this and it, I'm going to probably bang this into everyone's head by the end of the night. Um, you've got to look at it as physical. So physical is sand, silt, clay, and organic matter. Then the biological piece. And lastly, the chemistry. So in order for me to start uh, with a client, the first thing I do is I order a battery of tests. I do what's called a saturate, or I do what's called a, um, uh, a regular chemistry test, a textural test, and a saturated paste test. So what these tests are, the basic chemistry test will tell me the relationships of your micro, macro, uh, and intermediate, intermittent or inter intermediary nutrients. Um, the saturated paste test tells me the relationship between calcium, magnesium, and potassium. That ratio should be the target ratio is 75% calcium, 18% uh, magnesium, and 7% potassium. So within a few points, you're okay. But that's telling you that that soil is suitable for plant growth. Um, and the last is the textural. So the textural test will tell you how many parts, uh, what percentage is sand, what percentage is silt, and what percentage is clay, and what percentage is organic matter. Sometimes you actually have to ask for the organic matter fraction to be tested. So those, that's where I'd start. Um, then I would uh, actually take a soil sample and microscope it and see what kind of life is there. I actually lived in Eastie for a while, so I know that uh, those are All very right. depleted. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I lived right at the end of the runway there. I forget the name of the street. Uh, one one block in from the water. Uh, if you if you tell me the street, I'll remember it. Uh, uh, Saratoga over towards uh, or over towards Winthrop. Yeah, Winthrop. Yeah, no, okay. I wasn't in Winthrop. I was closer to the city. Uh, I was a block. I was able to walk down to the little Chinese food place at the end there. They had the best Chinese food. Oh my God, I miss that place. Anyway, that was years ago. But um, back to the matter at hand. So. In that situation, what I would probably do is <clears throat> assume that we have very little biological life. Now, a good friend of mine runs a fish farm uh, down on Cape Cod, uh, Blue Stream uh, Aquaculture. And he's finally, after years of me uh, convincing him to actually open up and start selling a uh, fish fertilizer. So he will have a liquid biological inoculant, which is an AMO, aquatic microorganisms. Um, what they do is they actually start establishing a lot of yeasts in the soil, which is the gateway to the saprophytic fungi kingdom, um, which is a very big piece. Uh, if you look at the biological world, 50% of your biological, uh, um, what we call nutrient cycling system or relationship soil structure or uh, decomposing is the fungi kingdom. So half of that kingdom is mycorrhizae. The other half is saprophytic. But if you do not have yeast to get it going, it's very difficult to get those established. The other half of the nutrient cycling system are called predators, or protozoa. Um, there are two good ones, which are called flagellates and amoeba. And those will come in with the AMO product from Keith. Um, the other one is a ciliate. Now, ciliates are a, a, an indicator of anaerobic environment. In an anaerobic environment, you will not grow the kind of plants that you want. I mean, in a swamp, if you're trying to grow skunk cabbage, you need an anaerobic soil, but you need an aerobic because you're probably going to want to grow bushes, grasses, and flowers. So that's really that's really the key starting point. And then from there, I would use a, a very uh, rich humic acid to start building some of the more flexible or I um, should say available organic compounds that those organisms are going to um, live off of. It's all about carbon in the soil. 
the more carbon you have, the more diverse and intense biological uh, activity that you can get. Um, was that a was that a decent answer for you? That was great. And and actually, what is um, kind of exciting is there right down the street from uh, this park, there's a Channel Fish Company, which has been a family owned East Boston business that primarily makes fish extract for cat pet food. Um, and so they've been expressed an interest in supporting the project. So I may, you know, maybe if I follow up and get some specifics from you, I might be able to get, um, you know, th some of that, um, some of that AMA or that uh, the AMO from, from a local source. All right. AMO is a little different. AMO is actually manure. So what they're doing is they're stripping the oils for the cat, the oils and the proteins. So they probably have what's called a fish hydrolysate. Or if, uh, the other one is, um, shoot, there's three types. Hydrolysate, which is the whole fish. Uh, my brain's cramped. Anyway, you just, just ask them what is their byproducts. Because, yes, that has some value for sure to feed the microbiology in the soil. But you got to get the biology there first. So, so you really don't. As well? Yeah, emulsion and emission. So emulsion has the oil stripped out. And emission is just, you know, is, uh, emulsion's been cooked, I think, too. Uh, so you're losing a lot of the things that you really want. Um, and emission is just the, the leftovers after everything else has been taken. So just be careful about what you're using. But again, you want to make sure that you get the biology in place first before you start feeding uh, what's there. Because you're just going to end up with a, a bacterial plume and it's probably going to go anaerobic very quickly. And then you're going to have a smelly park and your neighbors are not going to be happy with you. <laughs> Well, I appreciate it. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll keep you guys posted on this. Uh, and and, 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 Ethan, your, and yeah. Ethan, you, you mentioned that you said you wanted to make it part of like a land art installation as well. Could you tell us a little bit more about, you kind of mentioned there might be some interesting interactions. Maybe tell a little bit about the, what some of the ideas you had? Sure. I mean, I, what I was, I mean, I was thinking about this as, um, uh, well, let's see. I mean, the soil regeneration, but um primarily, but but then thinking about it as putting in a temporary walkway uh, and, you know, healing this, creating a pollinator garden. I've, I've actually connected with a group on, uh, which you guys may know about, um, Make Soil, which is a, all about kind of collecting, um, uh, collecting, uh, you know, like setting up a sort of community-based composting. And this is, a, as uh, Leighton probably knows, we're right by the airport. We're right by a lot of fossil fuel storage. Like this is a really um, environmental justice community. And so there's a lot of interest in greening and regenerating. And um, so it's, a, it's an interesting place and a really important place, I think, to be working. So, I mean, I would love if the city gave me permission to make this a food forest um, you know, that would be, that would be rad. But what I wanted to do is just start by healing this, you know, this little circle of land and kind of going from there. Awesome. Yeah. There's definitely lots of cool interactions to do. Yeah. Leaf, feel free to drop in and mention. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think much I am going to say here is going to be more useful than what Leighton just said. That was, that was like the real spiel of stuff to do. Um, and, and although I will say maybe he was using the word half rather liberally, I think I heard him say it like three or four times. Wow. How many holes are we dealing with? <laughs> Not to bust your balls, but um, yeah, I, 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 just to bring it back to you, you were mentioning biochar at the beginning. And like, as Craig and Layton both mentioned, like biochar is good. You need to add the biology. The biochar isn't inherently going to have that. But I do like what you were saying about like, there is woody material on site and producing biochar on site because in the process of restoring land there's it's not a singular dimension it's not just like get the soil structure built up get stuff growing from it if it's like this is a space to be important to the community you know having a collective fire is one of the most ancient human traditions there is so like in, in having a biochar burn can kind of fill that almost like ceremonial role in a space so i think that's a cool thing to think about and um you know just in general with making biochar i mean based on what sebastian was just saying you know i'm, I'm sure there's people here who know way more about biochar than i do but just the, the general gist of it is that the difference between biochar and just having a campfire is that you're like you're burning the plant material in a setting where there's a limited amount of oxygen because 
it takes oxygen to make the combustion happen, which actually like burns and releases the heat. So if you burn something in a setting with a lack of oxygen, then it will suck the gas out of it without actually burning it. And that's kind of how biochar is made is it's like the wood material. But when you in the process of sucking the gas out, you also evaporate all the moisture, which then makes it so if there's no moisture, then no microorganisms are going to start decomposing that material. And then it becomes kind of this like inert charged surface, just in case anyone was curious about that biochar background. Yeah, that's really helpful. And Leaf, that's exactly what I want to do. I want to, I would love to do it in public and make biochar. Again, this just involves a few more permits, but if it's in the, if, if it's in the context of like an art project, you know, sometimes you can get some, uh, you know, you can, you can call it art and, uh, and, and get away with it. And definitely um, one of the first things that kind of get things going, I understand like doing anything in a s urban, suburban, or relatively a community, let's say like an H HOA, the Homeowners Association reminds you, you don't actually own your land sometimes or your apartment, uh, but it's, it's important to get <laughs> consent from the people around it. Um, you know, a notion too is that, you know, just getting something growing on that piece of land, even if it's passively, most people might not recognize as you're doing, you know, seed bombs are pretty essential for getting a number of the community gardens going in New York City back in the 70s when the city was kind of falling apart given given the budget crisis and there wasn't much to do. And so people were pretty much taking over these empty lots, um, which were kind of just kind of opened kind of dumping grounds, using seed bombs to kind of start getting plants going there because ultimately it's the plants that are making the soil. Um, so that's something definitely to look into. It might be a way to kind of get the ball rolling. So when you get all the permits and you can start on day one, you're not having to like, you know, rebuild the wheel because plants, even a number of herbaceous plants that we call tend to call weeds, they're doing a good job of basically thriving in environments that are depleted. But at the same time, they're able to put exudates into the soil and also too, they're able to add their biomass back uh, into the soil as well. So that might be a great starting can, can I, point. Can I just, can I just throw it out here right now, just lay it out here that weed is a derogatory term for early successional plants, early successional species. Definitely. <laughs> they're, uh, they're, they're showing you that something's wrong and kind of that you're moving, moving to that secondary stress and sitting back to stage. All right. Um, yeah, and definitely to refresh the room, we are welcome to Sexy Soil, Living Soil Conversation for Growers. We're kind of talking about the dynamics. Uh, we're touching on a wide things, regenerative, organic, biointensive. There's a whole uh, malo of different names that these practices are, but they're all kind of achieving the same goal to emulate an ecosystem kind of growth, uh, growth, grow plants or to build soil in the way that nature does. We'd love to have more people kind of step on up and ask any questions and comments. Don't be shy. Um, definitely lots of kind of in interesting things. So if you're maybe hopping in here and you're curious, there's definitely lots of jumping off points we can talk into as well. But I guess maybe to kill some time, um, um, oh, we actually got someone. Oh, Jason Gideon. All right. Hey there. And Jace, Jason, I actually met you at uh, yeah. at Chris's class back Absolutely. in October in, in the before times, right? You the know, before times. That's before right. Times. We were still able to talk to people and hang out close next to each other without masks and 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 share uh just uh just a, a very close campfire so you know we we huddled at that session we huddled making biochar around a pot of sunflower heads right um we made biochar at that event and that was sunflower heads was was the way that we that was what we used primarily and and you are using a closed kettle you know a closed iron skillet pot with a lid uh to trap again to trap some of that air in there and that moisture in there so that you're you're not burning away all the material and just ending up with ash you need that material you need the material left because that's where the bacteria will start to live if they're you know they're, they're like little condos uh, for exactly. the bacteria to, to colonate those areas so um, yeah, I, I think sun, sunflowers is also something that's readily available here in New England. J Jason, so, do you want to introduce yourself real quick? Absolutely. So uh, Jason Gideon, um, also known as Hota Herb on Instagram. I'm a home hobbyist uh, cultivator and uh, very interested in regenerative practices, KNF, Jadam. I've uh, spent lots of time chatting with Leighton 
and uh, absolutely spent a session with you, Craig. Uh, fantastic uh, week together. It was. Much. It was. Uh, it was definitely a mind blower. Yep, absolutely. And uh, you know, Light is another guy that I love to give a big hug to, and unfortunately, I haven't been able to see Light and give him a big hug. And uh, it's it's uh, it it is tough. I mean, we are. Um, I hosted a mass central mass. Wait, are we talking about me? Do you, are you, are you talking about me when you said life? Uh, Lighten. <laughs> That's the pun on Leaf's name. <laughs> yes, uh, I met Jason at a regenerative organic uh, cannabis conference that I'd been hosting for a number of years. And, yeah. uh, you know, great guy. And, and I'm looking forward to chopping it up tonight, brother. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, gl I'm glad to be here. And, um, you know, it, it's uh, I also hosted a monthly grower session in Worcester, so central Massachusetts, uh, getting together local cannabis home cultivators and on a monthly basis to just talk about growing, uh, just to, you know, smell each other's jars and talk about what we were growing and how we were growing it. And we did a couple of KNF sessions. We made lab uh, right there at the uh, at the event. But it was just it was great to be able to get together with people and actually share the product, talk about how the product was created, you know, what went into growing this plant that you just spent a half a year on um, and talking about the techniques we were using and, and how to do these things indoors. Um, one of the things that I've spent the last year and a half learning uh, since I, you know, went to Lighten's Regenerative Conference and uh, spent time with Craig at the KNF, uh, at KNF training with Chris Trump is how to downscale those things for small indoor grow. Uh, it's, you know, a lot of the time they talk about a field and how you spray a quarter acre or an acre, or, you know, and you're making hundreds and hundreds of liters of, uh, of mixture where I use, I'm making eight gallons of compost tea. I'm making five gallons Jason, of compost tea. <laughs> Jason, do you want to share a little bit about maybe what, you're talking about for those who don't know, maybe a little bit about natural farming inputs sure. and kind of the more intimate interaction you have with your land and growing the plants that are on that land as well, and also yep. re and also restoring the land. Yep. Um, so again, I started my journey actually at Lighten's conference. So Lighten's conference really opened up my eyes to a different approach to cultivation and growing things. Up till then, I was very much uh, buying bottled nutrients. Uh, following the directions that were on the bottles and uh, putting different things on my plants based on what was offered to me or what was trendy or what I found in stores. And uh, going to that conference opened up my eyes to a different approach to how I looked at how I grew my own food and how I grew my cannabis. And so that started a uh, a, a process of learning and change over time where I started replacing the things that I was doing, that I was purchasing commercially with things that I was making myself. So um, part of the regenerative family, and there's lots of parts of the regenerative family, is a school of thought called, of a school of farming called Korean natural farming. And it's uh, been widely trained and propagated to people here in the U.S. through Chris Trump and his uh, naturalfarming.co site. And uh, Chris is a fantastic speaker. He's been all over the world and he, uh, he's a tremendous teacher of cultivation of all kinds. And he actually doesn't focus on cannabis. He focuses on other things. He comes from a family of macadamia nut farmers, actually. And uh, the, the Korean natural farming school is about creating natural products from what's around you and taking advantage of that natural local microorganisms and life and bringing that into your garden, into your uh, home cultivation, just into your environment, uh, capturing those things that are in your environment, that are indigenous, that are successful where you live, and utilizing them to help build a health and successful environment 
on things that you make yourself. Um, and I think, um, you know, you talked earlier about some of those plants that are early secession plants that some people refer to as weeds. Well, those plants are a tremendous source of nutrients that you can, you can go out in your yard and grab a bunch of comfrey or mugwort or horsetail and actually make a nutrient to feed your plants from. You don't need to go out and buy these things. And by using those local indigenous things and adapting, you know, utilizing the things that are successful in your environment, your environment becomes more successful because they're the things that are going to be the su successful organisms, bacteria, microbial life, fungal life, um, all the different things, the archaea even, uh, that can be affected by environmental changes, uh, where you live, the environment, the height, altitudes, uh, what the seasons are like, all those different things really affect your plant's health. And by being able to take advantage of the things around you, it's tremendous. Tremendous. You know, you know, I wanted to just pipe in real quick, and I think this is a, a misnomer that people don't get, is there's no such thing as a bad plant. Um, every plant mm -hmm. is pulling up a nutrient to make the soil ready for the yep. next successional species. So even those dandelions are, have value. If you, if you just search it and look at what they can do, um, you know, all... Uh, using it to brew uh, in your compost teas, uh, things like that. Just um, it's a very powerful tool and leaves fall around us all the time. And, um, and we don't necessarily, we rake them, we uh, throw them in piles, we bag them, we have them hauled away by companies. Yet that stuff is an incredibly powerful input um, that is doesn't cost anything it's free it's all around us yeah let me let me jump and speak about that as well is what you're talking about is making humic acid and it's a it's a very readily available source of carbon and you're right leaves should be left <laughs> not hauled away <laughs> yeah yeah no i see I, I gotta chime in on that because that is something that i it's it's like it's like a it's a overused thing I tell people at this point about leaves being a biological inoculum. And like Jason, like you were saying, leaf mold, which I even would say that's a misnomer because it's called leaf mold because mold is in like fungi growing in it. But you get a lot of non-mold fungi, you'll get good mushrooms growing out of your leaf piles. But being that I'm like a lazy scientist person, I don't really want to be like going and turning my compost pile all the time. My favorite biological inoculum is in the fall. And where I live is a lot of deciduous trees. They drop their leaves, you know, get them in a pile, shred them, pile them up. And, and then just like four months later, you, you look at them and there's just all sorts of mycelium growing through them. It's, it's crazy how active they are. And, you know, and, and when you look into the science, it's actually there's starting to prove more and more that there's these like endophyte fungi that live inside of the leaves in the tree and the plant when it's healthy that just kind of like live inside of the plant and help the plants. But then when the leaves drop, they can turn into decomposers and start breaking it down. And those are the same types of fungi that'll be helping build soil, cycle nutrients, et cetera. So it's like, it's really actually tapping into the, you know, vast intelligence of nature when you do something like collect the leaves to fall off the trees on your property. It's something that seems so simple, but yet so elegant. And it's leveraging the fact that for the longest time we've, We've really 
we've really ignored or despised the microbial world, uh, mostly kind of focusing on a number of pathogens in that example. And the more we kind of understand the roles that these consortium or con the uh, consortium microbes do in nature and cycle nutrients, the more we can kind of harvest their powers. Definitely what Jason talked about using a number of uh, homemade inputs or leveraging the microbial ecology that happens in these in these environments. And what you're using is using a number of materials and inputs to help uh, select for ones that are beneficial or to, or to stabilize these microbes. So it's really interesting kind of having some experience in molecular biology and microbiology. A lot of the similar techniques are using in natural farming are kind of low tech, no tech, um, you know, microbial culture and bioreactors in ways that you're maximizing diversity. A lot of the conventional laboratory techniques focus upon the isolation or reduction of the culture as well. Jason, awesome to have you on. I'm going to move you back to the audience. Oh. I want to, did you want to add some, oh, what's up, Edward? No, Frank wanted to ask Joda, Jason, a question. So I, uh, I think we think you can leave him up here. Sure. Yeah. Frank, what's, what's going on? How you guys doing? Um, big fan of uh, a lot of you guys on here, uh, Layton, Jason, uh, Craig, Edward. I really appreciate all your guys' work. Um, so, uh, Jason and Lee, I know you guys are from the Northeast. Uh, I'm from Massachusetts myself. And I just want to ask you guys, when it comes to winter, we, we do deal with a lot of struggles when it comes to winter. We can't just go out and harvest these nutrients as we please. Now, is there anything you guys do to store these nutrients to kind of think ahead of time to to get ready for the winter uh anything you guys store to kind of get you through the winter before you uh gone. yep absolutely so um part of the uh, back to korean natural farming part of korean natural farming you make a you take those collections of indigenous microorganisms and you basically create and sporulate them into grain and a wood medium to make what's called the IMO, Indigenous Microorganism 3. Um, that IMO 3 can then be combined with soil to make IMO 4, and then you move into some, some later stages for IMO 5. But that IMO 3 is, uh, is basically uh, microbial life that is asleep and ready to go as soon as it gets introduced to water. And so I keep it in a bucket in my basement um, all winter, and I've been using it in my compost tea on a weekly basis. So it's just in a bin, and I go over and I grab a couple spoonfuls, and I put it into a bag, and I make my uh, liquid IMO. So that's one thing that I do over the winter. Um, Making IMO is a multi-day process, and so uh, you're making enough to last you for your season. So you want to scale a large enough set that it's going to last you for the year, and it's, it's not really that much. It's about 20 gallons worth of total material when you combine it, and feel free to reach out to me on IG, and I'm happy to talk about some of the uh, sizing of the recipes, but that's one thing. And the other great thing that anybody can take advantage of anywhere is have a worm bin in your house. Put it in your basement, put it in uh, an area where it's not going to freeze, obviously. You don't want to keep it out in your garage if your garage isn't heated, but having a worm bin in the basement is a fantastic thing to do with your food scraps because you don't want to be hauling them out through two or three feet of snow. So bring the food scraps downstairs and throw them in the worm bin. Uh, you can use your shredded paper. So as you get mail and things like that, shred that paper. You can also throw that in the worm bin. And your worm, that worm uh, compost is a tremendous growth medium. Um, you can, uh, I've grown in, I've grown plants with as much as 30% of the medium being worm castings. Um, so worm castings are just a tremendous tool. So that's another thing that you can do in anywhere, but especially here in New England, take advantage of in the winter time um, when you can't necessarily go out and turn a compost pile. Like my wood chip pile for my compost pile, it's all frozen. I can't even chip. Uh, wood chips out of that pile right now because we had you know over a month of, of below freezing weather so uh, you can't turn a compost pile in the winter but you can have a worm bin in your basement awesome 
Jason, yeah, this is great. I'm gonna I'm gonna reset the room real quick just to bring up our speed. I'm gonna make a quick comment about vermicomposting and kind of the natural farming. So you probably heard I am a one, two, and a number of numbers. So I'll explain that anyway. So uh, welcome to Sexy Soil, Living Soil Conversation for Growers. Uh, I'm Craig Truster, moderating. We're kind of this is a room where we're talking about all the kind of different names for regenerative agriculture. Uh, natural farming, organic, really the whole whole purpose is to kind of talk about how we're working with nature to emulate ecosystems with the ability of us as humans having relatively large brain social skills and thumbs. Uh, we can, as much as our, our propensity to build, the uh, much as our propensity in the past has been to extract, so many things we can work with nature to build things in this proactive way. Um, so kind of talking about the overall range of details of how we can em work with nature and emulate these systems and cycles to to grow and restore the environment uh, while growing food and equity at the same time. Um, yeah, so I'll kind of just give a quick little overview about vermicompost. You remember, if you're familiar, vermicomposting is the process of using uh, insects or worms to basically actively break down food, uh, bi plant biomass or food scraps. Uh, a notion of worms, what's really interesting is the worms actually don't necessarily eat the food. What they're eating is they're eating the bacteria and fungi that are growing on the food scraps. So what's really amazing is that the worms have inside their gut, they have this the center where they, they grind up um, the food scraps. They're gonna basically going to be squeezing and crushing the bacteria, the fungi, the protozoa, the little micro nematodes, toads. And what they're pooping out is basically plant-available uh, nutrients because the bacteria and fungi have been breaking down the nutrients inside their bodies they have soluble forms of micronutrients, uh, macronutrients, and trace elements along with their dissolubilizing and breakdown, both inorganic and ways of emulating nature. The key to natural farming is IMO, indigenous like organisms. This is a that's the process by which you're collecting ambient microbes from your environment from a number of places around uh, land that you're growing or an area you're growing. Uh, so going to an area that is minimally disturbed of ecology, a six, uh, in, uh, in a, an area of advanced ecological succession. Commonly, you're getting a box made of cedar that has uh, aeration, uh, aeration available to it. Inside this box, you're putting uh, rice that is slightly undercooked um, with less water. Um, and then also, too, basically, you're using a type of rice that has a high protein to fat ratio to its carbohydrate. There are many different types of rice. Uh, Calrose rice is one. For example, anyway, go out to the forest, you take your undercooked rice, uh, put it in the box, you cover it, let it sit for about a week, week and a half, and then the microbial biology, the biology it's often referred to, will basically grow on this substrate um, of basically of this under, under, undercooked rice. And so after after basically a week and a half, a week, you'll go ahead and check on it. You'll see this bloom of mycelium, bacteria, fungi, uh, and you're pretty much got the basically the starting stock of this captured biology. That's IMO one. That is the collection. IMO two is then stabilizing this collection. So what you're doing, in by essence, you're taking this collection of this mass of your rice, you're weighing it out, and you're adding equal parts of a raw. Uh, sugar to it. Um, so most sugar, white sugar, basically they process it and they've extracted it. And what the extract in it is pretty much the molasses. So it, we need to use raw sugar or brown sugar. Um, the idea is you're adding all the trace elements that are back uh, in that sugar source. So uh, so um, a raw sugar is preferential. Um, what you're doing when you're adding the sugar is that you're pretty much stabilizing it. Your sugar is a desiccant. It's going to pull water out of it. Microbes are mostly water. And so what you're doing is you're triggering a stress event where the majority of microbes, uh, bacteria, um, so basically bacteria uh, and fungi, they'll sporulate. Um, nematodes and protozoa will insist they'll make these rigid structures and you'll pretty much put them to sleep but over time this uh, this mass of sugar and rice will break down passively so that's IMO2 uh, IMO2 shelf stable IMO3 is basically you waking this back up you would get a bucket um, you would basically get a water that's relatively clean not too many not too many particulates or chlorinates treated to that can impact the biological diversity and you're adding a number of inputs you're adding uh, humic acid, uh, which is basically complex fungal foods um, that are going to be basically help the fungal population take off. You're going to be adding a ferment uh, called OHN, Oriental Herb Nutrient, which is a combination of garlic, ginger, uh, angelica, and cinnamon uh, that's basically been brewed in, or fermented in, uh, in a light beer or vodka over time. 
uh, this acts to basically select beneficial microbes and push out the the opportunistic pathogenic microbes. You're adding into adding into the bucket with uh, and adding into the bucket with some seawater. Seawater acts as basically trace uh, minerals. You could use a high quality sea salt as well. Um, the sea is rich with minerals. That's why sea salt is also a, a good stable nutrition stabilizer as well. And then you're adding like a roughly a small amount, like a fingertip or two fingertips of uh, of your IMO2. And then this bucket, you will add it to a uh, a set amount of substrate, um, carbon and nitrogen rich. One example might be wood chips and a rice bran. Uh, the idea is you're basically providing both fungal and microbial food. And then once you've done this, you've inoculated, you have IMO3. IMO3, you would then add basically into your soil after it's gotten to temperature and range. That's a whole other detail we'll get into right now, keeping it simple. Uh, you would add that IMO3 into your soil. That would go into IMO4, which you've stabilized soil. And after IMO4, the microbes you basically set up and have germinated, they are then adapted to your soil. You can then add in start start adding in high nitrogen sources to that pile. So you could basically work with manure. Even some people have added animal carcasses to it. Um, I've heard some anecdotes that after about two weeks, they've had an entire animal carcass get decomposed. And it's the fact that you pretty much maximized, you pretty much cultured uh, the maximum diversity of microorganisms through this indigenous microorganism connection. So uh, the whole breakdown from IMO1 to IMO5. So this is kind of a key point of natural farming. There are a number of fermenting techniques available when you're basically taking a number of your, um, per se, you're taking a number of your um, your waste products or more so even, even plants and be problematic review is weeds. Like we said, weeds are plants that are more so um, opportunistic. They're surviving and they're basically surviving in certain environments, but they're also accumulating lots of nutrients from the soil. So basically you can ferment your weeds um, and basically turn them into this fungal compost using this anaerobic uh, fermentation process uh, with a high sugar content, allowing the microbes to break down the bacteria to break down a number of these bacterial foods you then can add them into into your into your compost setup to basically make this fungal rich food compost as well that's an overview of natural farming but the idea is the key part of natural farming is imo okay that was a rather medium-sized nutshell frank i would love to hear from you hey craig oh, you know uh, yeah can i ask you can i ask you a question about um so what i've been doing is putting uh, malted barley in my worm bin and they love it it's it's like uh, I noticed the cocoons on them uh, are much uh, more abundant, and I was wondering if you speak on um, is it the en enzymes uh, creating this process? Uh, if you could speak on that more. Uh, was that you, Craig, that he was asking? Well, you you take it away. I, I'm going to shut my gob. <laughs> I'm going to try to make sure everyone has equal time in this room. <laughs> Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of um, really good additives for your um, worm bin. I'm, I'm a big fan of starting with a really good bedding. Um, yes, paper is good, but I prefer to get some leaves, um, some chips, and some other natural sources for them. Um, you want to you create an, an aerated environment, something that's going to um, provide enough oxygen so that it doesn't go anaerobic. Um, one of the biggest mistakes I find in vermicomposting is that the compost goes anaerobic and you kill the worms and turn it into a big slime ball. So there's where you don't want to overfeed. You really want to let those worms work through that material a number of times. So once again, less is more. Um, and just be careful about, you know, when you're trying something new, just add a little bit and see how the worms react. Um, that's critical. And then as you see, if they're, if they're really tearing through that, then you can add a little more. If they ignore it, then you want to pull it out of there um, so that you don't create that, that complete crash in the worm bin. Um, I'd also like to speak on preparing for the winter, and this is good for anywhere uh, in the Northern Hemisphere and, and the far Southern Hemisphere as well. And that is that I would always make compost in the spring and the fall. And what I would do is I would build it Hugel style. So for those of you who don't understand Hugel culture, um, basically you take an old rotten log um, and you lay it, lay it down on the ground, on the ground, don't bury it. And then I would lay tree tip branches still alive on top of it, making a tent. Then after I did that, I would take some straw or hay and I'd lay down a heavy mat over the top of that, creating that tent. Um, and then I would start building compost on top of that, um, watering it and adding inoculant if I had it, um, and then build it up to about three or four feet tall. And as long as the log is. 
Now, the key to this is you take your compost thermometer and watch it. If, you, if it doesn't do anything, then you didn't add enough greens and browns. The ratio should be 66% browns, 34% greens. That's critical. And I do not use nitrogen uh, manures. Uh, sometimes I'll add distiller's waste, which is another great nematode food, um, but not a lot of it because it'll, it'll create heat. The key to this compost is you do not want it to hit 120 degrees. At 120 degrees, you're losing your diverse microbial communities. So once I build a pile, I'll monitor the temperature for the first week. It usually goes up to 115, 110, great. As it starts to turn down, when the thermophytic bacteria start to um, <clears throat> depopulate uh, and go back into cyst form, the temperature drops down to 100, and then I plant it. I plant it with as many things as I can get. Um, grasses, little shrubs, little trees, acorns, um, whatever I can to build that cover. I want that thing completely covered over for the winter. And what happens is while those plants are growing, they're, they're shooting out tons of roots and around the outside of the root is what's called the rhizosphere. In that rhizosphere is where all the magic is happening, where these organisms, the bacteria are breaking down sand, silt, clay and organic matter. The protozoa are coming along and eating those guys and pooping out uh, plant available food, which is making the plants grow even faster. But then what happens is that that pile will not completely freeze, especially if you build it right at the edge of the wood. You do not want to build this on a lawn. You really want to build it, you know, off the edge of your property in the woods. Because if you've ever noticed being in New England or any other area, the woods don't totally freeze. You might get a layer of frost at the top of it but it's not, it's not frozen so solid like a rock. And so with all those plants and all that microbial activity, that will overwinter and then come spring, you will have some of the most amazing biological inoculant that you can find. So not only is it gonna have all of the, the good ingredients that those plants took up, you know, a lot of people don't even think about like, what is a plant doing? A plant is mining all the material, all those sand, silt and clay, hard, hard to get bound up nutrients and bringing it up into itself. So it's just a living natural source of all kinds of plant available materials. I like to refer as using plants to feed plants. So there's a great trick for you to, to overwinter your compost and have it ready to go for you in the spring. So use that trick, all right, Frank? And good to hear from you, my friend. Awesome, thank you, Leighton. Frank, did you have any uh, last questions or comments? I want to give uh, the next, I want to definitely make sure we get through the cycle of speakers. Frank, uh, are you there? Yeah, sorry about that. What did you guys uh, ask? Oh yeah, uh, any last questions or comments? I want to make um, sure we can get through our uh, next people and get up on stage. Um, no, I'll let other people get a chance. Definitely, I appreciate it, Layton. Awesome. And, and, uh, Jason, uh, he's not there anymore, but I appreciate you guys. Thank you. Frank, likewise, great to have you. Much love, Frank. Have a good one. How's it going, Sean? Sean, how's it going? Uh, welcome to uh, welcome to our little panel we got here. Any questions or comments? All right, what's well, all good? Leaf, do you, is there anything you want to... Yeah, while well, we're waiting for the next thing, not that you all want to hear environmentalist propaganda or anything, but I, I got, like Jason was talking about when you're making the worm bins, you can take all your paper waste and put it in them and they'll turn it into rich biological material. And if we're the kind of people who are thinking about like, uh, you know, global climate issues and things like that, there's a lot of things that people throw around there, but I, I've done, I've done work, I've done research working with landfills and ultimately, a big a big issue is like we've got a huge place where a bunch of trash goes. And if you can feed your paper to the worms, it's like it's a really it's really um, you know it's good on the on the triple bottom line. And uh, you know we all get a bunch of bullshit mail, so I just want to really second to that notion of you know turning one man's trash into another man's treasure. Don't forget cardboard, my friend. <laughs> we all have tons of cardboard. Oh, well, I mean, in that sheet mulch, you don't even need to give that to your worms. You know, you save that for like, you know, <laughs> suppressing early successional species, that was we like to call them. John, are you there? I am. Yeah, trying to hit the microphone in the lower right, not your right. All good. Okay, so I'm a small home grower, uh, indoor four by eight. 
And one thing I've noticed within living soil is there's no, no, or there has not been much discussion of water. It's just the soil. So earlier in another SCP on YouTube, Leighton talked about having an aquarium. So for someone like myself in a four by eight, what size aquarium would you recommend and what fish species would be my target? And then to further add to that, is there a ratio of square footage of grow to size of aquarium? Wow, that's a great question, my friend. Um, what I usually recommend for people who are first starting out um, is get goldfish or koi. Koi are great because you can grow, you can buy them very inexpensively at your pet store and grow them out for six months to a year and then sell them back to the pet store at a profit. So they're an easy, they're easy uh, to take care of. They jump out of the tank, you can put them right back in. Um, another nice thing about koi is the feed uh, conversion ratio. So they are wonderful growers. Um, you know, fish as a whole tend to grow a lot quicker on feed than per se in uh, a cow. A cow is a 20 to one feed ratio. Fish are about a 1.5 to one ratio. So they're gonna gain a pound and a half to every pound or a pound of weight to every pound and a half of food. Um, so now, the key to, to, to the aquarium is, is really not the size, it's, it's what you're comfortable with. Um, there's a stocking density. So one of the things that's important to think about is how much biomass, and that would be fish, to the gallons of water that you have. There's a lot of information out there online. Um, and I highly recommend you start a little bit lower and let the fish grow in. Um, one of the hardest things is to start the fish tank. And, you know, I'll probably get hated on for this, but I would take a little bit of your urine and dump that into the tank because that's going to help start the nitrifying bacteria cycle, which is taking ammonia and converting it into nitrite and then into nitrate, which is harmless to the fish and the plants. That's the key to aquaponics right there. So then once you have your little fish tank going, you have a filter filtration of some kind. Um, there's a wonderful little one uh, on YouTube or on the internet that is like a little bubbler. So it, it has a, um, you connect it to your bubbler and you stick it in the middle of the tank and it cleans the suspended solids in the water column. And those suspended solids are rocket fuel. So what you do is once you're done collecting all of those solids, you take that filter out, you pour that water into a little cup uh, or can or a bottle or whatever, um, add your air stone to it and aerate it until it smells sweet. Once it smells sweet, then you want to dump that inoculant onto your plants and your plants will react. You'll see reaction within an hour or within uh, 24 hours. So start small until you get comfortable. Use a fish that's really easy to grow and then, then get crazy. I mean, you know, there's a lot of beautiful uh, exotic fish that you can, again, you know, you grow them to a certain size. Once they get too big, bring them back to the pet store as long as they're healthy. They will uptrade you for feeds or bigger tanks or whatever. You just start building a credit there. Um, that's a wonderful way to get, you know, into uh, this world of, you know, fish keeping or aquaculture um, while you're taking care of your plants. Did that answer your question? Absolutely. That was great information. Thanks. That was all I had. Hey, hey, I have a quick question for Sean. Sean, that, that's a cool, that's a cool picture on your profile there. Where are you at? Are you, is that like Humboldt or? Or sequoias in Kings Canyon? No, actually, that was a random picture from Reddit. Um, I'll track down the source and get it to you. Okay, I thought that was you there, man. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, on the on the East Coast, we're, de we're definitely uh, jealous of the uh, vegetation you got out there on the West Coast. They kind of clear cut everything a couple hundred years back. So, uh, you know, there are some pockets, but they're harder to find for sure. Definitely. Well, that was that was great, and I think definitely one point is to understand that. You know, I, I do think about this a lot is that we tend to think about ecosystems, right? You know, most water is essential to life. You know, life started in the sea. They started an aquatic life form. And understanding, too, is as life moved on to sea that I've heard people kind of see a disconnect between, um, you know, aquatic ecosystems, aquaculture, and, you know, land-based ecosystems or soil. But the realization that the riparian is the fact that you're getting this multiplying effect um you know this margin that when the edge you're having this doubling if not quadrupling of species because you get this interaction point where 
organisms have the ability to kind of live different parts of life cycles, um, either on land or in the water or vice versa, beginning, ending, staging, and also the viability of nutrients. Um, and definitely also I think a lot about, um, you know, the dynamics that do happen, um, especially with some of the work that Leighton has been doing with, uh, with fermenting um, things anaerobically and then aerobically stabilizing them. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting dynamics how we can emulate a lot of these natural riparian or aquatic ecologies and and basically harvest a lot of these biogeochemical psychos. Bio meaning the biology, geo referring to the earth or the inorganic material, and the chemical meaning the interaction of the biological chemistry and the inorganic chemistry as well. So yeah, yeah. And when we think about the riparian zone, even a lot of like the animals in there are animals that have adapted a lifestyle that is both aquatic and terrestrial. Like a lot of the like stoneflies, mayflies, caddisflies, dragonflies, the things if, if you're like a fly fisherman, you'd use as bait. And they're like the bugs or the critters, the insects that live in a stream. But that's their larvae. Their larvae will like crawl around and eat, actually like crawl around and eat fungi off of decomposing leaves or like eat algae off of the rocks. But then when they mature, then they like a butterfly or, you know, any other, you know, metamorphosizing animal turns into a flying insect, flies up and like mates and goes in the canopy and lays a bunch of eggs and dies. So in, in the biological reality, there's this very direct link between the aquatic and the terrestrial, which I'll just leave that as a setup for maybe, maybe late. And you want to talk more about this and how it might relate on a microbial level. Absolutely. Um, so we had the great human expansion. Look back 2,000 years ago or 1,000 years ago, before we had this great expansion, we had mass migrations. The ducks and the geese used to blacken the sky as they migrated. Uh, Four-legged buffalo, uh, deer, moose, you know, depending on where you were, were trashing through lakes, streams, rivers, uh, dragging all of those aquatic microorganisms up onto the earth. I mean, if you just simply look at the amoeba, the amoeba lives in the water and lives in soil. Rotifers live in the soil and they live in the water. There are so many interrelationships between aquatic and terrestrial organisms. It's not funny. And our diversity has gone down because we don't have those mass migrations anymore, which is where I started my work, uh, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, I was trying to harness, trying to reestablish a way to take those microorganisms and apply them to soil. And every time I did it, I saw incredible plant reaction. And that's what drove me down to, to Rodale Institute to meet Dr. Lane Ingham to find out what, why, this was, why this was happening, what was going on, um, which ended up being a year and a half study, uh, three to four days a week under her tutelage um, to really get a handle on all of this. So if you think about where we were in fertility and production a thousand years ago um, our health was was fantastic all the animals health was fantastic but as we expanded we started to wipe out the ability of the earth's own natural cycles to make sure that our soils were as fertile as they possi possibly could be by natural cycling systems that was awesome leighton and also, thank you, Sean, for coming up, asking us some solid questions. Definitely the perspective, the home grower, I think a lot of with the kind of natural farming or permaculture, you oftentimes people will like, they'll be taught it at large scale, but it's like, hey, like I'm a person, I got a basement and I only got so much space. And this is something too, is my background was in, was in fungi and kind of that big tradition of growing mushrooms. Um, growing gourmet mushrooms that you could then uh, you use a lot these leftover spent mushroom substrate to build your soil this is something you can do in compact spaces so i think definitely um the way we make the change over to a regenerative world or a restorative world is by decentralization and distribution of these processes not by centralization obviously it will be a task to kind of convert the larger plots of our lands to practices that help build the biodiversity but also this is can be something can be done in kind of like a the domain of your own apartment or own space or you know adaptable work with whatever you got in that kind of space and function as well sean did you have any quick other questions or comments before we move on to niaz I'm all good. Thank you for the platform. Awesome, Niaz. Awesome, Sean. All right, Niaz, you're up. How's it going? Um, going well. Awesome. Great to be here. Thanks. This is Craig. 
Is that you speaking? Yep, that's me speaking. Uh, we got Leighton, Leaf, and Edward up here. Uh, I just want to make sure I pronounce your name correctly. Uh, is it Niaz? Yes, it is. It is. Thanks for letting me speak here. So Definitely. I, I have some um, um, background with growing. I happen to be working with a Canadian LP right now um, as their business developer. So what, what, what I wanted to ask was, um, you, have you had any experience with, like, what are your thoughts on silica? and um sol you know solubilizing microbes that help in that increase the bioavailability of this quartz and supposedly um that's really supposed to help us stop pm so there's a lot of pm issues do you guys have like pm issues when it comes to uh growing um you know organically and highly fungally active you're not going to have those kinds of issues and especially if you start spraying compost tea on the leaf surface now again this is a fungally dominant compost tea the biggest problem with compost it's not all created equally worse yet a lot of the stuff that's out there is not even mature so you're going to actually steal nitrogen from your plant but if you do get a really good fungally dominant compost you can make an extract with it and spray it on the plants at the first sign of powdery mildew and then you can hold it at bay but once once powdery mildew takes over it's impossible to control it so again you've got to start with a really biologically diverse soil system and then you need to get your hands on good microbial inoculants uh, such as a, a fungally dominant uh, compost are you familiar with composting as a whole yeah, a little bit. I got. A, I, I took a course on it. But what 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 what's ha what we use, or most of the growers that we work with down here, um, they use we use ProMix, okay, and then we just add in the nutrients, like whatever the nutrient. Um, you know, some of them are using plant prod. You know, others are using like advanced nutrients or whatever. But the thing is, like, my question was more like, you know, that's silica. So I um, we're using these, it's fractured silica. And I've been hearing a lot of people use silica, 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 I happen to use silica products, and they're really nice for my plants. But this is like a more of an organic thing. Um, so um, they have this, the, these quartz, these fractured quartz, really high in silica. And then they add these uh, my, my microbes that solubilize the... The, the silica. So what I did was I got I got two control tests going on at two different LPs here in Ottawa, and if the product works, um, it, it's going to work if it if it if it helps remove um, the PM. But I was just wondering, I guess, when it came to growing in living soil, were there were there different issues than when you were growing with, you know, a nutrient um, like a soil that was you know, pro mix, it was, it wasn't, it's not really alive, you know what I mean? As living soil is just alive with all the good stuff in there. Yeah, so basically you would be considered a hydroponic <laughs> grower. So you're going to, you're going to have to fight these things because you're not giving the plant its ability to build its own defenses. So you're, you're basically making this plant operate at a capacity um, that is not a completely naturalized system. And so, you know, again, we, we put on this conference called learnlivingsoils.com. I highly suggest uh, you, you, you get on there, you, re you buy the replays, they're 50 bucks a piece, it's, it's short money. Um, we're going to also be talking uh, about some new technology this Saturday and Sunday that's available, um, it's just coming to market. And some of these are going to help with, with your issues, in, especially when you're growing a plant uh, without letting it grow its natural defenses. Like I could go on about this for hours about, you know, the differences between these systems. And it's always been an issue. Anytime you're in a synthetic grow environment that the plant does not have its, its ability to fight off um, even the simplest of pests. And as you well know, once you get into an indoor controlled environment, shit gets out of control really, really fast. And once it gets out of control, it's, it's over. You, you're now you're just, fighting it 
And everybody that I've converted to living soil systems comes back to me and thanks me and goes, I had no idea how easy this was. I was intimidated by it. Yeah. But now, now I'm not fighting the plant. I, I'm not doing anything but walking around looking at how well the plant is actually growing. That's so amazing. again, yeah, my recommendation is go to that learnlivingsoils.com, register, watch it. You're going to have, uh, there's like literally uh, 18 hours of content per weekend session. And we've already got two in the can. And we're putting another one on this weekend. But that's going to give you the comfort um, and the confidence to switch once and for all. Uh, the re- because the reason, the, sorry, the reason why I didn't really go, I love living in soil, like that's what I'd like to smoke. But the thing is, it I from what I understand, maybe it's a wide scale, but you know, you get a less um, a, a grams per square foot. Well, let me ask, like one thing I'll kind of talk about is that the notion is what we're doing is we're trying to shift the fungal to bacteria ratio of the soil. So most most plants, you know, if you're trying to grow, let's say like uh, just simple kind of greens or kale kale crops or coal crops, they're they the ecology they are able to thrive in is far more of a, a bacterially yeah. dominant ratio. Um, if we're trying to grow plants that require, like for example, like hemp or vegetable or kind of row crops, they require more of a fungal ratio. So when you're talking about um, the product you were mentioning, and then you know the silica and the microbes, what is allowing the plant to get those macro micro nutrients and trace elements is the biology. It's the bacteria and fungi that are in the system that are solubilizing. So the thing is in general is that building that soil. So when we say living soil, it's it's more so a simple label to describe that there is a living biome in there, that there is an established microbiology. Because the reality is that this is how these organisms have co-evolved over hundreds of millions of years. Um, you know, you go back to the Devonian period, roughly 500 million years ago, that's when life kind of moved on to land. Um, and the most primitive ancestors of plants were the symbiosis between cyanobacteria, algae, and some of these fungi, some of these arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, which are the oldest fungi. And so we go on further domestication and we go on to further evolution and cohabitation to that. Long story short, the focus is it is the biology in the soil, which is essential. So when people say living, it's the fact that it is literally living. You have billions upon billions of microbes helping the plant acquire those nutrients in exchange for the for the photosynthates, the complex sugars, proteins, and lipids that the plant is pumping down. And one more trick that you can try if without going, if you're not allowed to do the living soil thing is go and make some labs, lactic acid bacteria, and you can foliar spray that and that will also help keep at bay. It's not going to cure it, but um, really look at your cultivars, my friend. I think you know, if you can get away from cultivars, cultivars that are typically uh, PM, um, you know, have PM issues, that's going to be a big leg up for you uh, in that situation. Thanks for sharing. Thank you so much. Awesome. Glad to have you, Nas. Any last quick comments? I want to get Tom up this. Yeah, like if um, if any of you um, use silica, actually, that you put it in your in in your mix of your living soil. You you, um, you don't you don't need to uh, apply it. You don't. It's the idea is that in your parent material, um, and then your parent material, there are rough proportions of the trace macronutrients, micronutrients, trace elements. However, when we do soil tests, when we do a soil test, it depends upon the reagent because the thing is you're, you're looking at the the total pool, the exchangeable pool, and the soluble pool. So the total pool is literally you using very very powerful oxidizing, very powerful acids or bases to basically break down the inorganic material and look at the mineral composition in general. The exchangeable pool is what's there, what, what can be utilized, it can be pulled off by the biology. Um, so when we say the term cation exchange capacity, that's part of it. And the soluble is literally just by water. So when we're using fertilizers, those are soluble because literally they're salts. You put them into a solution, those cations and anions are going to dissociate into the solution in general. So the silica when it comes to that, when you're establishing the biology, the notion of adding amendments, there are some examples, but it, working with the whole aspect of understanding what's in your soil from a primary test, understanding the texture, the composition of sand, silt, and clay, and also the proportional relation of how much of that soil is organic matter as well. However, without biology, having a high organic matter will get you nowhere. That's the biology that's able to be the interface between with the plant, the plant's going to pump down the exudates, 
uh, the microbes are able to solubilize those nutrients and start generating that and then driving that to the point where if your organic matter is thermodynamically efficient, that's going to help yielding the generation of soil organic matter. So that's, I could go on for a bit and definitely talk about redox chemistry, but in a nutshell, that's the whole thing. Is that, that, that helpful? That answer your question? Thank you so much. And um, that answers my questions for now. I'm just going to listen. Sounds, sounds good. I'm going to move back to the audience. All right, Tom, you're up. Hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for having me up. It is indeed very educational. So I've really thoroughly enjoyed what has been discussed. And uh, I hope I have not um, asked a question um, that has been discussed before. But uh, I have basically uh, two questions. One uh, involves outreach. Um, and knowledge and education for the public. And the other one involves uh, exometabolomics. And um, for the first one, uh, I'm wondering uh, how much in general are people aware um, uh, of the fact that um, we don't want to really add too much nutrients um, to the soil as much as we want to sort of maintain the native population um, of the soil community because it's sort of, uh, I guess it's the sort of the population uh, and the ratios of the microbes in the soil that interacts with the plant and um, you have signaling and so forth that is more important than just pure robust growth. And because I feel that uh, in general, people seem to just want faster and quicker to the point that they neglect um, just the approach of, well, let's nature take its course slowly and just be a little bit more patient. And um, so I wonder whether um, uh, there's some outreach to let people know that, well, maybe um, more is not better in a way. And uh, so that's the first one. And the second question is that, has uh, anyone really looked at um, the exometabolomics um, uh, to look at all the plant signals that's going on under different conditions. Um, I know it's a little bit hard, but in a way, then we can sort of eavesdrop a little bit more on the plant cell um, interaction uh, and the communication under different conditions. And we might be able to first uh, understand what's going on uh, to see which uh, metabolite is causing the plants to grow slow or faster uh, or whatnot. And, uh, and correlate that with what the actual microbes are doing. Thank you very much. Tom, that was a great question. I'm gonna take the second part since I have some direct answers for that. Um, Leaf and Leighton, uh, feel free. Leaf, you wanna start? We haven't heard from you in a hot minute for the- um, Well, may maybe you would do a, a better answer for the, for the second part. I have some I'll add on if you don't bring it up. All right, I guess that leaves me. <laughs> so the reason I formed this conference four years ago was to teach people about <clears throat> working with uh, living systems. Um, and it all starts with making sure that you're starting with soil that has plant uh, parent material. So if you're trying to go into learn, uh, living soils, you need to make sure that you have sand, silt, and clay, as well as organic matter. And traditional cannabis is grown only in organic matter, in a super soil or a soilless medium, and then they pile it in with either organic or inorganic nutrients. The organic nutrients are, are bound up, uh, so they would be like flour meal, crab meal, um, stuff like that, rock dust that isn't readily available without the microbial community breaking it down. So those guys would always make compost teas and use the compost teas as the biological inoculant to break that stuff down. That system works pretty darn well. Um, the other system is where you're pumping it with bottled nutrients and you have no real association with advanced biology. Um, that's, that's a system that's a lot more complicated. Um, you've heard of nutrient lock and, and you can also get nutrient lock with the first system. Uh, it's a matter of when you get your chemistry out of balance, things lock up and the plant can't function. One of the most important things that are overlooked in this industry is your micronutrients. Those micronutrients are the, the key thing to allow the plant to metabolize and produce those enzymes and functions, you know, everything from its energy currency to exudates to respiration to growth. So, you know, it's this is a really complex and, and deep question. And that's why, again, 
go to learnlivingsoils.com, sign up. We go, we take you from zero to a hundred so that you really get these concepts. Um, we, Chip and I did a presentation on chemistry and what its functions within the plant are. And that was a really important piece that I think the community is missing as a whole. So I'm gonna let step back and uh, hopefully you'll do sign up and you'll really learn a tremendous amount about living soil. All right, Lee, if you wanna go ahead and some of the advocacy points and how we can get the education. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll just start by throwing out on, on this, my, what I was thinking on the second question when you're talking about like the metabolites, do we know what's going on in the soil? Um, and it depends on what plant you're talking about, probably for something like Arapidopsis thaliana, which is one of the like type species plant organisms that gets academic research poured into like defining exactly what it does. There's probably a lot of research on like what its exudates are, how they're affecting things like that. But then once we get out into other types of plants that maybe don't have as much institutional funding behind them, we can't really know specifically what they're, you know, like soil metabolites are doing, but that could change in the future, you know, because this is becoming more accessible research to do. There's a lot more, um, you know, funding into alternative crops and regenerative agriculture popping up these days. So, you know, I say that's something to definitely keep your eyes out for and, you know, try, encourage it if you can. But yeah, then on the education side of it, it's like, yeah, I mean, that that's a big question because being that like my background is more as an ecologist and I know like I, I like down the road got into regenerative agriculture topics because as you know, I was like, all right, ecology, the ecology is getting destroyed on our planet. There's some level of conservation, but we also have to figure out how to like create new ecologies. And then, you know, what's what in terms of how people modify the landscape and, you know, propagate plants, agriculture is one of the main ways. So how do we, have agriculture be a tool of regenerating ecologies. This, you know, it's it's kind of a, a, a big topic, but what you were saying, Tom, about specifically like, you know, telling people not to over fertilize, I think like a, 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 I'm, I'm sure there's all sorts of people out there trying to, you know, educate about this, but a big um, important educational message about it is to like not view soil and plants and ecosystems as some sort of math equation where it's like, we add this number of this thing and then it produces this outcome, but to view it more as as a community, a society, a nation, a civilization, an interplanetary civilization, whatever it is, where it's like, it's not just like you add this thing in and it comes out. There's so many variables that we want to like, we want to maintain us like a culture there. <laughs> and then when we work with microorganisms, you're like, oh, yeah, I cultured this bacteria, I cultured this fungus. You know, there's it may not be a coincidence that the language relates that way, but the idea is like picturing it as like the different nutrients in the soil are like having a diverse diet as a human. You know, you if, if someone just drops a pallet full of hamburgers in the middle of some neighborhood and be like, all right, that's enough calories for you all to survive. Like, you know, you're set. It's like those are going to be a lot of unhealthy people. And that's the same way it is with our with plants where it's like, you know. They, they, the nitrogen is the building block of amino acids and proteins, so they definitely need that. But then, yeah, you know, boron, manganese, molybdenum, zinc, copper, all these things play a role. So like a balanced diet, just like in a human, requires that. And so, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's really just like perceiving the plants and the soil ecosystem not as some like reductionist math equation, but as like a complex society or culture, not, I mean, you don't get carried away with it, you know, keep it utilitarian with like, what are the nutrients, who are the biological actors, but that can, you know, help see what's going on a lot better. And, you know, hopefully people are teaching that. I don't know. I guess I'm trying to do it right now. Awesome. Thanks, Lee. And yeah, Tom, I'll uh, kind of summate some advocacy and talk about some of the exo metabolomics you mentioned, uh, some sources for that. <clears throat> anyway, but yeah, the notion in general is that um, how do we get here, right? Um, a lot of the a lot of the principles about agriculture in at least America is the fact that a large part of the westward expansion was due to the fact that in order to restore your soil, you had to have sufficient manure for animals. Uh, a large number of people that were growing uh, couldn't afford these animals to restoration. So the push forward was for more, um, you know, basically more pure land or soils that weren't spoiled. And they got to the Great Plains where they had some of the most productive soils in history, this, these grasslands 
with with basically feet of soil. However, the continual production of tillage eroded these down, and basically we got to the point where right around the point between war, end of World War One and the beginning of World War Two, we pretty much were starting to get the dust bowls and kind of reached this kind of peak tillage that had occurred. And so oftentimes the pointers we basically tilled our topsoil off to the point where it pretty much blew away, breaking down the biology that was helping to restore it impaired. Right around the same time, there was ample compounds which are precursor for munitions. Um, a lot of these fertilizers and chemicals could actually be used, used to be made from the same precursors for a bunch of industrial compounds that were used for munitions in wartime. So it was kind of great application because there was often people were desperate. So the thing is, when you actually start putting a bunch of these fertilizer salts onto your plants, the response is great because oftentimes the plant is stressed, it'll basically be getting what it needs. However, the plant will no longer be investing these combinations of specific eggs to track the microbiology in the soil. So the reality in general is if you're feeding the plant continuously at a certain point, it's going to be able to get those nitrogens, but it's going to be deficient in the micronutrients, macronutrients, and well, mostly the trace elements, which, you know, the re relation is the plant will still try to synthesize those proteins. It'll go through the process of basically tra basically transcribing that DNA to RNA and then translating RNA into protein. However, if you're missing those key those key elements, which basically are essential for holding in certain positions of molecules and biosynthesis pathways, the plant's going to be pretty unhealthy. So that's kind of the notion is that a lot of it was more reaction kind of at the right time. And also at the same time, at the end, at the end of World War II, most of Europe and other parts of Asia were bombed flat. The notion was, how do we feed the next billion people? And so it was a reaction. The Green Revolution was more so good intentions, but not full. we understood chemistry for understood biology. So I think advocacy is important. People are waking up to it, especially with the quality of their food. People are kind of interested into more locally grown, organic food, welfare of not just animals, but also the land itself. Um, and like, and a big part is too, is that we're probably seeing a number of problems. This is just an educated guess, you know, the idea is that you can't make claims unless you can provide ample evidence. But the reality is we, by depleting the soil microbiome, we might actually be undercutting a significant point of inoculation for healthy gut biota. So this is one thing as well. Uh, on the note of kind of the exometabolomics, and I'll kind of uh, break that down for the room that people may not understand it. Um, so we're currently in the age of molecular sciences. It's pretty amazing because the factors is we're kind of understanding uh, the biological underpinnings of life. You know, the DNA molecule, the motif or character of it is one of the most ubiquitous symbols in science so far, if not after the, after the symbol of the simplified atom during the atomic age in general. So we're at the point now where we can actually uh, we can sequence DNA pretty efficiently in cost point. We can also synthesize it as well. What's even more amazing is we actually are able, after we generate all this data, we can actually generate the processes to actually uh, as assemble all these huge amount of genetic data and also perceive them. But, but also too, we cannot just sequence the DNA of the organism to do the, do the genomics. We can also we can also sequence the RNA, the transcriptomics. We can basically get a sense of what's going on what enzymes or proteins they're actually performing, what parts of the genome are being expressed. And even more so, we can actually potentially look now into the actual, the substrates, the parts of biological matter that these organisms are, are breaking down with their enzymes and making products. So the metabolomics is the process of linking the genomic data with the trans transcriptomic data um, that basically are coding for the proteins and enzymes that the uh, organisms are using with the actual physical metabolites the substrates and the products. So that's metabolomics, uh, basically that you're making a link between what's happening in the environment, the metabolism, and the actual genetic information in the organism. So Tim, to answer your question, that was a bit of a primer. Um, I believe Rex Maelstrom at JGI, they have a dedicated group. Um, I would really recommend if you go to JGI's website or YouTube, they have a um, they have, they have some great outreach. They just started their next five-year plans. So they've been pushing really hard to engage the public community. They have a blog post from, let's see, November, November 19, 2020, on the uh, Joint Genome Institute, at JGI. Uh, it's the uh, part, DOE, Office of Science User Facility. Uh, November night, engaging webinar, harnessing JGI's metabolomics capabilities. They go over, I believe, an example with switchgrass and kind of looking at some pathways. But even further, they had a collaboration with... Um, the Environmental Molecular Sciences Laboratory in the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. Um, it was the Department of Energy's multi-scale microbial modeling course. So this was really cool because they're looking at how they can emulate these ecosystems because they want to see what, what changes that climate change or contamination or different shifts will affect these microbial populations. 
because we understand a lot of this biogeochemical functioning is happening in the microbiology. Now, microorganisms are able to adapt pretty rapidly, but the macroorganisms like plants and animals uh, are, do not adapt so reflexively to these kind of changes. So it's pretty understanding we understand the function where oftentimes the notion of organism, enzymes, and substrate were grouped together, where now we can actually break them down and actually simulate some, some, some models. Uh, this is actually pretty amazing. Uh, cybernetic simulation model of ecologies called p flow trans and it sounds pretty wild but uh if you can go on to k base the department of energy's knowledge base kbase.us you go to their news section or learn section and you can look for the course it's called multi-scale multi-scale microbial modeling it is free your tax dollars are paid for it so i hope that answered your question yes thank you very much uh, actually i'm um using it right now as we're speaking. Uh, I'm part of the uh, Enigma Consortium, uh, Adam Arkin and uh, Paul Adams. So um, it's actually uh, really nice to um, hear about all these things. And yes, uh, um, like the microbiome in general um, is just an absolutely wonderful topic. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's been fun. Thanks, Tom. Let's simply stay in touch. Love the work you're doing. And I think there's a huge point to kind of make this outreach of some of the how far we come in the kind of omics era and how we can look at some of these amazing anecdotes that people are growing with natural or regenerative or biocentric or biointensive systems and kind of bring that into the molecular. All right. So yeah, that was, that was informative. That was, that, that was, <laughs> that was, that was pretty heady. That was a rather big nutshell for sure. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, well, I guess while we wait for maybe someone else to come ask a question, I'll just chime in a little bit because you were talking about nutrients and, um, you know, the, the, at a certain point you're talking about the trace nutrients, the trace minerals and why they're so important. And, you know, because it's like I, I heard someone frame it once in a way I really liked, which is they used to think that there was six essential nutrients for a plant to grow and needed six different nutrients. It was like oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, phosphorus. And I'm, I'm not going to list the other two. But then uh, down the road, they figure out there was actually like 12 essential nutrients for plants to like grow and be healthy. And then further down the road, they found there was like 20 and then 25 and 30. They're up to like 42, 45 or something now. But but basically, the, the, I mean, I think the moral of the story is that like they keep finding out that other nutrients are actually useful to plants. And some of them a lot, and that's like the trace minerals, a part of it's because they're like plants don't need a lot of them. They just need a little bit of them. And one of the main things that they do is that they will function as an important sort of like foundation or anchor for a lot of specialized enzymes. So like, like in terms of like human health, and which this also relates to plant health, there's certain enzymes that it's like they don't normally come into use in our body because we normally don't need them, but occasionally they'll become important because this enzyme helps to disable some sort of cancer cell or in a plant, this enzyme helps to disable some sort of pathogen that's infected it. So it's not an essential nutrient unless if the organism comes into contact with that type of you know threat to it. And so it's like, you know, some, you know, some of these other nutrients might not really get looked at in this way. But the idea that like in the modern era, whether it's human health and we have all the modern human diseases with all the all the cancers and the heart diseases and the things that like didn't used to really happen to people that much. And the same thing with plants where you know, a lot of the molds and pathogens and things are like used to not be that much of an issue until we have more agricultural systems and especially monocrop agriculture and depleting the soil microbiome. So a lot of these trace minerals and nutrients, they, they provide this important function of like being the thing that a specialized enzyme that may or may not be useful to you, but if it is useful, it might be the difference between life and death. Like these are important minerals to have, even if like on, if you look at like a big, picture like economic analysis of yield and production they may not show up as being as important but uh um, yeah that's um ju just a thought to throw in there and, and i guess another point of that is that like that whatever they're up to 40 something elements there's like what i don't know how many elements on the periodic table but there's over 100 and if the number keeps going up in some way we should intuitively suspect that most of the elements that exist in our physical reality are probably 
you know, helpful in some way or some, something has figured out how to utilize them. And uh, Craig, you know. Craig, that, Craig, that was beautifully stated. And in my mind, they are all critical because each one of them is allowing for another of another community or another succession of organisms to uh, continue to grow and or uh, contribute to the whole, to the whole big picture. Um, you know, and, and you're right. I mean, every year, like in science, we're rewriting everything that we knew. Um, so I don't expect that to ever change. I mean, maybe some of the radioactive elements are, are not critical yeah, for pr all probably, biological prob life. Probably not after 92. <laughs> probably not. <until> <laughs> <then>. <laughs> But that being said, um, they're, they're factors that, that, you know, we can't comprehend yet. Uh, <clears throat> but as science, as science opens these uh, books and pages um, to new understandings, um, you know, it'll, it's, it's an interesting time to be alive, that's for sure. And there were some questions that popped up on um, Future Cannabis Project, our sister platform that is also listening to us. Um, and let me see if I can bounce over and answer, uh, ask some of those questions. So. For one of Peter's guests, he asked, how do worms hunt and sense food? Uh, ask how worms find food and whether they prefer certain types of food. Uh, Craig, you want to answer that one? Chemo, Texas. So, yeah, um, to, to my understanding in general. Um, so when, okay, so who's ever, I'm sure everyone's had an experience with a roommate, a sibling, a significant other, or someone who's kind of left something in the refrigerator or out on the counter that's gone a little too ripe with age right you know what it's pretty cognizant it's pretty it's pretty simple to know why you're cognizant of why it's decomposing rapidly um you know the whole process that that organic matter on it are a wide variety of bacteria and fungi because that's the whole process about how organic matter will break down and decompose in that process of those organisms using enzymes to break down that organic matter, those products and turn uh, those substrates and turn them into products, there are a wide number of compounds that are produced, especially aromatic compounds. So we understand in general, a large number of organic compounds are essential for the sensing, the chemical sensing that occurs. You know, this is why scent is such a powerful scent. Uh, this is why sense of smell is such a powerful scent because it's directly plugged in straight into your brain. So the olfactory part of your brain is incredibly productive and powerful for memory, for sensing, in the same way for a lot of lower types forms of organisms. So through the decomposition of organic matter in your worm bin, they're basically smelling the metabolic action that's being performed by the bacteria and fungi, and, and then also the protozoa and the nematodes and other, and other microorganisms that are basically engaging in the kind of uh, the trophic food web in the soil or inside your compost and on the organic. Anything you guys want to add to that? Well said, my friend. That's what I want to add. Very well said. Cool beans. Do you have anyone that wants Cut. to ask any questions? We got more. Yeah, I got some more for you. Hang on. Cool beans. Hey, I've got a quick question. Go ahead. I, you know, one of my very best friends growing up in the 70s, they, they had a big, huge commercial grow, of course, illegally in Hana, Maui. And, um, and then an, another friend of mine, his brothers had a, a private grow in their backyard cannabis. Um, it was probably a third of an acre in an, you know, enclosed. Um, at, the, at those times in, in the history of cultivation of, of, of marijuana, um, were they using techniques that you guys are describing now or were they just much more rudimentary and some basic like you know growing avocados or, or growing you know row crops what's the difference between those two things and and where have they gone to now i know that's a big that's a good question i mean i off the bat would say i have no idea what they were doing because uh, <laughs> you know it was back that was before i was born but um i mean just in it's not to say that people weren't utilizing living soil techniques back then, but it wasn't until like the nineties and two thousands before science had really like established that there were like mycorrhizal fungi exchanging nutrients and soil microbes doing things like that. And so what's interesting about a lot of this stuff is it is like a modern scientific breakthrough in a way, at least in defining it, not necessarily in the, it being applied because you can go back thousands of years and like, you know, Craig and Leigh were mentioning earlier with like Terra Preta and like all this like there are people for thousands of years ago were like doing the whole like composting 
culturing living things and using it to grow stuff. But in terms of when it's been like observed and defined by modern science has really been more in the last 30 years. So we, we really are in kind of like probably a renaissance of knowledge of like how this stuff actually works. And, you know, not to say that people, you know, doing whatever they were doing back then weren't like, you know, still utilizing biological growing techniques, but it's, you know, it's hard to imagine they had that granular amount of knowledge about it. Similar to like with something like, like biodynamic techniques, which are developed by, you know, Rudolf Steiner back in the early 1900s. It's like, yeah, they, they didn't know that much about microbiology back then. So, well, those techniques are effective, but it's like you, you can't necessarily like extrapolate what happened back then onto now because it's almost like we, we know too much in a certain way. That's so, yeah. I'd love to speak on that briefly. Um, I, I'm so lucky. Uh, I've met some of the, you know, grandfathers and patriarchs of, of cannabis cultivation in Northern California. And um, yeah, in speaking with them, <clears throat> they basically had no idea when they were digging this hole, you know, up in the forest and planting their cannabis plant that this mycorrhizae that was just a, a credible fungal you know, mat of both saprophytes and mycorrhizae uh, would just instantly come in and colonize their plant. And so by, by default, they were, they were growing in living soils and they would add these, you know, incredible recipes of um, all kinds of different organic nutrients. So like ground up shells, meals, uh, you know, basalt dust. I mean, some of the formulas I saw from these guys was like, holy cow, you guys, you had no idea what you were doing, but you were nailing it because they were providing the microbial foods that would encourage the colonization that was that was happening all around the plants that they had just planted. Um, it wasn't until they started, you know, hauling the plants up into the trees, which they literally did, um, that they started to have nutrient deficiencies and they didn't understand why, but it was because the plant was no longer having those kinds of associations uh, in the existing soil system. And if you look at the uh, the places they they grew up in, in, you know, the Emerald Triangle, I mean, you have, you know, incredibly fungally dominant soils up there and, you know, healthy because they hadn't been disturbed yet, uh, other than the guys digging holes and planting in them. And, you know, so so that kind of system in, in every way, they were like a true living organic system, a living soil. And it wasn't until the next generation where all of a sudden, you know, these bottled nutrients came out because people were climbing up in trees and feeding, you know, nutrients to their plants um, that they had this disassociation with the understanding that it was the soil food web that was actually doing the work for them. And so that was kind of started the revolution of, oh, we got to use nutrients now. And, and then it then it pushed into, you know, the great drug wars where. Now the guys had to start doing these diesel grows where they'd bury generators and bury containers and, and grow inside these little containers. And again, no association with the outside soil. Um, and so that pushed the nutrient system even further down the road. And then they started having all kinds of pest problems and then they needed pesticides, insecticides. Um, so that really kind of, they lost touch with what it was that the first generation of growers was actually doing. Um, and again, you know, the knowledge wasn't there that there was all this association to biology. Everybody looked at dirt as dirt is just dirt. It's what is, who cares? It's just where you put your plant. No, it's really important to understand that there's a whole nother incredible universe of, of diverse organisms in concert that are creating that perfect growing environment. And I'd love to touch back on, on something that the last gentleman was talking about was yields. And what people don't understand is once they truly get to a, an ultimate living soil system, your yields are not going to be less. They're going to be more potent. And so why not work less hard, spend less much money, uh, make more money because it's more powerful? Um, I think that's the net gain all the way across. Um, and I'd love to hear somebody chime in if they think otherwise. Definitely. And I think part of it, too, is there's a bunch of other people investigating um, the techniques of this living soil or the soil microbiology. Fuck living soils, they're bullshit. Why are you guys, <laughs> are you guys pushing the soil on all these people? <laughs> Come on. 
come on, come on. We can be honest. We're amongst well, friends here. Well, I'm going to push back against you. Um, so some great work that's being done by Dr. Dave Johnson over at uh, New Mexico State University and uh, Chico State. Um, he's looked into extrapolating upon um, how to, you know, really understand the kind of action that's going on in the soil. Definitely doing a lot of molecular biology analysis. Um, his approach initially started with dealing with the fact that a number of dairy farmers or or people that were they were basically cow herders in general had an had an abundance of cow manure, um, cow manure that was really high in salt. Given the fact that what you what you're feeding your cows is usually kind of standard, um, you know, feedstocks are really high in salts and a number of things that can really be hard to compost. That actually, if you were to just liberally apply that manure to your uh, to your plants, it actually burned them because the salt concentration was so high. So this started by investigating a bunch of these kind of passive compost systems that were fungally dominant, these static composting systems. So created uh, this kind of stand-up compost pile, uh, which you can think of as a bioreactor called the, he named it Johnson Sioux Bioreactor after his wife's name as well, he co-invented it with. But also part two, he was doing a lot of investigation into what's going on in the microbial communities. And he found when he did the, uh, the transcript omics on a bunch of these piles that the largest presence of the transcripts were there were for quorum sensing. That something is happening when you boost this microbial ecology, you're actually getting these kind of interesting secondary and tertiary interactions of these establishments, the communities, which normally probably weren't present in conventional agriculture because it was so intensive on chemical and pesticides and kind of cleaning up the messes, which using that, using the, and these kind of artificial Fertilizers um, basically discourage the microbial attraction. Then once the plant's in trouble, you got to basically dose it with things that will kill the pests and pathogens, and you're kind of in this negative feedback loop in general. So what's amazing on yields is that he's looked into the factor by using these these enhanced agricultural approaches. We kind of he kind of came to the conclusion that basically we've been breeding plants to grow in marginal soils for a while. So once you introduce plants into a, a system of soil that's basically has restored the biodiversity you'll get incredible yields and growth. I think it was examples of uh, sunflowers that were growing well over, I think about 12 or 13 feet or certain crop volumes. Because the reality is once you're basically able to establish the biology, you're going to unlock the genetic potential of these plants because they aren't fighting for their lives. The plants can actually put more of those photosynthates back into their roots, their shoots, their leaves, their fruits, rather than trying to continue put it into the soil to attract a microbiology that is often not there because it's been selected out with a chemical conventional approach. Wow, well said, Craig. Very well said. Um, so what do you guys want to do? It's six o'clock now. I don't know about you guys, but I'm pretty fried. Um, should we kill it and, and come back next week on the same bat time, same bat channel? Nah, sounds good. Yeah, if does anyone have a final question they'd like to ask before we end the room? Um, one thing I'd like to say, uh, so much information here. Um, I want to thank Craig and Leighton and Leigh for sharing it with me. And I'm the um, I'm the layman of the moderators here, and uh, I wanted to to thank all the folks who are still here who contributed to the conversation. And um, if you do have one final question, you know, bring it up now. And if you don't, please follow um, everyone, the moderators, um, everyone in the room. Uh, we had a lot of, of of people here who stayed a long time to listen, and uh, we really appreciate you sticking around and and letting us share the information. I should say, letting Craig and Layton and Leif share the information, <laughs> but. Um, so um, did you guys have any final comments you wanted to make, Craig? I just want to shout out to the audience. Feel free to pop in if any quick comments. No worries. Don't uh, there, Remember, there are, there are no stupid questions, only stupid answers that we'll be happy to clarify and mull over together. So, you know, we're all learning this experience. Too. And I would just like to plug one more time. Uh, if you guys are interested in really understanding and deep diving down into living soils, please go to Learn Living Soil. Dot com. That's learnlivingsoil.com. And if anybody's interested, I'm uh, on, on Instagram, Kingdom Aquaponics LLC. Uh, and my website is Kingdom Aquaponics LLC.com. Thanks for coming in and we enjoy. Uh, oh, we got, we got, we, we got a live one right here. Hey, Dan. Good. Hey, thanks for all the content tonight. It's, it's been really great. I'm a commercial worm farmer. So, um, I hear what you're, what you're dishing out and would love to connect with all you guys uh, and look forward to hearing more from you next week. Great. Thank you, Dan. Appreciate it. All right. Well, this has been a great evening. I think we touched on a lot of cool topics. We can definitely, 
go down the rabbit hole. There's a lot of potential for cross platforms, getting more things gone, more features. But yeah, I think it's kind of this the whole Clubhouse platform has kind of came up a lot of unique opportunities. But I think the vocal connection without Nestle Vito does uh, offer some interesting opportunities. In yeah, and um, it's off topic, but if you all want to go more down the fungi rabbit hole, you can check out the new Applied Mycology podcast. Oh, that's right. With me and Craig co-host Applied Mycology. You can follow it or check it out on the podcast stuff. And we'll ramble your, you know, more, more than you ever wanted to know about what fungi are doing to our species right now. Definitely. But thanks for listening, everyone. I, it's an honor to be here and share information and whatnot. And hope you all gained something important out of this. All right. Without further ado, uh, I guess, uh, Edward, you can go ahead and end the room, and we'll see you all next week, same time and same virtual. Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Much love. Bye-bye. hear me <laughs> let me just kill that uh, do you hear words do you hear my words do you hear my words okay yes I can hear myself on that thing okay so just quickly I'm gonna run upstairs for dinner uh, Leighton wanted me to let everyone know that we're going to film him building his Soil Horizon system uh, on Monday, and then whenever I can actually edit that, it will. I might try to stream it live, but uh, that would be precocious. So anyway, uh, I'm going to get yelled at by Dwight in a second, so everyone have a good night, and uh, that was our first Clubhouse YouTube <laughs> conversation, so... We'll get better at it, but uh, it wasn't so bad. All right, see everyone.